So Paul, the Apostle Paul, ends Romans chapter 6 by calling us slaves of righteousness. Slaves of righteousness. And, you know, you say, no, wait a second. A slave? I mean, we talk against slavery here. and um, spiritual slavery, emotional slavery, slavery. We speak against that stuff here. We talk a lot about freedom. We talk a lot about what it means to be free. We talk a lot about what it means to be liberated, what we're free from and what we're free for and all of those things. So what is Paul getting at? It's kind of confusing. When you read the end of chapter 6, and he calls us slaves of righteousness. Well, let me just take a moment to kind of explain what's going on there because it sets us up perfectly for what he goes on to say in Romans chapter 7. For Paul, a slave of righteousness is a free person. It is a free person. And what he's doing there is he is showing that a slave of righteousness is one who has been forever granted the perfection of Jesus on their behalf, so they no longer have to spend their lives fending for themselves. In other words, as we'll see in a minute, Paul is making a statement of identity. He is telling you who you are. He is telling us who we are because we so quickly forget. A slave of righteousness means you cannot lose your standing before God as one loved and approved and pardoned forever. And so he's saying there's nothing you did to get the righteousness that you need, and therefore there is nothing you can do to lose the righteousness that you need. You are in a cage of righteousness. You are a slave of righteousness. You can't get out, and that's good news for you and me. No matter how hard we try, which Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much the internal warfare rages, we can't get out of God's cage of righteousness. We are clothed in an irremovable suit of righteousness and forgiveness. And so Paul says, you're you're a slave. Now he's making, as I mentioned, he's making an identity statement. He's telling Christians who they are. And this is what he's saying in chapter 6, as we saw last week, and toward the end of chapter 6 also. He's saying, you are not what you do. You think you are. I mean, the history of philosophy from Aristotle downwards has tried to figure out what makes a man or a woman who a man or a woman is. They've wrestled with identity issues, which are issues you and I wrestle with all the time. And basically, they've all said essentially the same thing in a variety of different ways. You are what you do. And yet, what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 6 is something entirely different. He's saying, you are not what you do, thank God. You are what Jesus has done for you. That's who you are. That is your identity. You don't always, as we'll see in chapter 7 in a second, you don't always act on the outside in accordance with who you really are. But as I've mentioned before, every time we sin, we are in that moment undergoing an identity crisis, a momentary identity crisis. We are forgetting who we really are. In fact, in that moment, we are forgetting what we really want. And so, uh, Paul is making an identity statement, and he's saying, you who were guilty are now forgiven. You who were an enemy are now loved. You who were once dead are now alive. That's who you are. That may not, you may not feel like that's who you are. You may look at your life and go, but my life is inconsistent with what you just described. Well, Paul talks about that in Romans 7. I mean, he is just a bundle of inconsistency. Just a bundle of inconsistency. And so you might say, well, I don't feel this way. I mean, I don't, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Paul's making this statement, but he doesn't know me. I mean, he doesn't really know me. But the fact of the matter is he is saying to you from the outside, 
You are what Jesus has done for you. You are a slave to righteousness, a slave to righteousness. And there's nothing you can do to be unslaved. Now, um, Martin Luther, one of my heroes, as I hope, as I hope you know by now, uh, coined a phrase in Latin, simil justus et peccator. I know that sounds like I'm really, really smart, and I am, okay. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I'm really not. Um, but he coined this phrase, simil justus et peccator, and When I first read the translation of it when I was in college, it changed my life. Because you see, I was a relatively new Christian. This was all new to me. You know, I mean, I I had been really, really, really bad. And then God's amazing grace rescued me and set me free and raised me from death to life. And I now had this relationship with God that I had never had before. And everything on the inside was changing, everything. I started to run toward the things that I used to run away from, and I used to run away, I started running away from the things that I used to run toward, and my desires changed, my wants changed. I I was a new creation, a new creature, but I still struggled mightily. I mean, I still struggled. No one ever told me that once God rescues you, life will be this upward moving escalator of progress. No one ever told me that, but that's what I assumed. I assumed that, you know, once, once you become a Christian, I mean, once you become a friend of God, once God saves you and adopts you into his family so that you are forever in, I mean, things just get easier and they didn't. They actually got much harder because as Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I, I didn't, I thought I was doing okay until God's law shined its bright light inside of me, and now I started becoming aware of sin in me that I had previously been unaware of before, because before I was dead. I was dead. And now I'm alive, and I'm seeing myself with brand new eyes, and I'm beginning to realize I'm not nearly as good as I thought I was. Well, that's what happened to me a relatively new Christian, and I was trying to make sense of this war that was going on inside of me. How is it that Paul can say in Romans chapter 6, you're a slave of righteousness, you who were dead are now alive. Your entire identity has been changed. You are not what you do, you are what Jesus has done for you. How can, how can that be true on the one hand, and Romans 7 also be true? Where Paul's going, I don't, the thing I want to do, I don't do. And the thing I don't want to do, those are the things I keep on doing. What's the matter with me? I mean, how can both of those things be true? And Luther coined the perfect phrase, simil justus et peccator, which means simultaneously justified and sinner. And when I read that as a sophomore in college, a 23-year-old sophomore in college, Um, I just, the light bulb went off, and I said, in one phrase, I have just been perfectly described, because that's, that's what Paul's doing. What he's saying in Romans 6 is justify, and what he's saying in Romans 7 is sinner. And the reason that some people have concluded that Romans chapter 7 cannot be Paul describing his Christian life because it doesn't sound very victorious. What he's describing is his pre-Christian life because then he bleeds into Romans 8, which we'll see in a couple of weeks, bleeds into Romans 8 and says, well, that was me before, but now look. It's not exactly what he does, but some people have read it that way. And I go, Romans chapter 7 is a perfect description of Paul as a Christian because he is saying essentially, I, the things I want to do, that, that, see that's what happened to me. My want started to change. So he says, the things that I want to do, I'm not doing. I'm still doing the old stuff. And the things that I don't want to do, I keep doing. I mean, what, what is the matter with me? 
I am this sort of internal conundrum and contradiction. And what, um, what Luther meant by simultaneously justified and sinner is that before God, our identity is not both and. Who you are is not both and before God. It's not, um, it's not I am a sinner and righteous. It is an either or. It is, you are either a sinner or righteous, a sinner or a saint, before God, vertically, okay? That is your identity. Um, so, simul justus et peccator is not a description of our Christian identity. It's not a description of who we are before God. What it is, however, and this is so important to understand, what it is, however, is a description of the both and that characterizes the Christian life as lived the way you and I actually experience life. So he wasn't saying, Luther was not in any way insinuating that before God you're both, before God you're in forever. That's what he says in chapter six. You're a slave of righteousness, you're in. Pardoned forever, you're in. That's who you are. You are the righteousness that God requires. You are a son, a child of God as a result of his sovereign, gracious adoption of you. That's who you are. However, as we live our life on the ground as broken people with other broken people in a broken world, we experience what Paul describes here in Romans 7. Now, let me just say real quick that Romans 7 saved my life. You see, because when I first became a Christian, and I've shared this before, but when I first became a Christian, um, I decided I was going to read the Bible from cover to cover. I had gone to Christian schools, and I had grown up in a Christian home, and I had been in church, but I had never really paid much attention to the Bible for myself other than memorizing the verses that my Bible teacher told me I had to memorize in order to get an A or memorizing the verses that my mom was teaching me before she would put me to bed or whatever. I mean, I, was, I wasn't a reader of anything, much less the Bible. So terribly confusing to me. I just didn't read it. And so when God saved me, I decided I'm going to start reading the Bible, and I'm going to read it cover to cover. You know, young, idealistic, ambitious, zealous, lots of zeal, no knowledge. So I started reading the Bible, and I began where everyone should begin reading the Bible, in Genesis, okay? And of course, I made it through Genesis because I knew all the stories. I grew up hearing all these stories. Made it through Exodus. Leviticus was a little bit testy. Um, You know, got to Numbers. And I'm like, I don't even know what the heck's going on here. Uh, Deuteronomy, I just quit. And I decided I would would move to the Psalms. You know, I'm just going to skip half the Bible because I don't understand it. And I'll just start reading the Psalms. And the Psalms were a little bit better because they were poetic and they were melodic and they were very honest. And, you know, they were kind of there to help me as I struggled in those early days and those early months. But there's a lot of Psalms. I mean, there are a lot, uh, and there are tons, and one of the Psalms is like 7,000 verses long. So I quit in the middle of that one and said, okay, I get it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. How many times can you say the same thing? So I skipped, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to go to the New Testament. So I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was sort of taken aback by the repetition Um, The Bible's very repetitious, so don't ever say to me, you repeat yourself. I say, good, so does God. I'm in good company. Um, Anyway, so I started reading uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I was familiar with those stories. The parables were kind of confusing to me. Got to Acts and um, loved the book of Acts because it was just sort of a history of the early church, and I understood that. And Paul's testimony resonated with me a lot. And he shares his testimony in Acts. And then I got to Romans. Romans 1, I understood everybody's bad. Romans 2, I understood everybody's bad. Romans 3, I understood Tullian's bad. Totally get that. Um, Then I got to Romans 4, 5, and 6, and I was totally confused. I mean, that's heavy-duty theology in those chapters. It really is. And it was using words that I didn't understand at all. Uh, But I 
plotted forward and pressed on, and I made my way to Romans 7. And I had never read anything like that before in my life. I just, I felt myself so accurately and powerfully described. I mean, I was a young Christian trying to figure things out, had way more questions than answers. But this I knew. When Paul said, I want to do the right thing, I really do, but I just, I keep doing the wrong thing. I want to think the right thoughts. I really, really do. God knows I do, but I just can't stop thinking the wrong thoughts. I I want to pursue those things that are good, but I keep falling back on bad habits. I mean, that was me. He was describing the internal angst that I was currently experiencing, that I was experiencing in that moment. And I remember thinking, at that point in time, Romans 7 is Tullian's chapter. It just is. I mean, there is no possibility of understanding the glory and just the gravity of Romans chapter 8 if you do not first feel yourself described in Romans chapter 7. If you can't read chapter 7 and go, oh, a wretched man that I am who will rescue me from this body of death, which is the way you're supposed to feel when you get to the end of Romans 7. I mean, you're supposed to get to the end of Romans 7 and go, I am in big trouble. I mean, I'm just... I, I I have just been perfectly and powerfully described, and I am without hope, without a lifeline, drowning in a sea of inconsistency and despair and desperation. You won't, Romans 8 won't be the bright, shiny day that it is, the rising of the sun that it is in the darkness of our soul if you don't first read Romans 7 and go, that's me. Well, that happened to me. Now, I, I, um, I hate to sound alarmist, uh, but I think the church is in trouble. Okay, now every generation, some Joe Schmo stands up and goes, the church is in trouble. Okay, I get it. I know. I mean, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. I am the son of a psychologist, but I'm not the son of a prophet. Um, I'm not pretending um, that I know something that no one else knows or anything like that, but I'm out there and I talk to people and I travel and I hear stories and I, (sighs) the church is in trouble, in my opinion, okay, in my humble but infallibly accurate opinion, okay, (laughs) the church is in trouble. I mean, I, and I don't mean that, listen, when I say that, I don't mean that the church universal is in trouble because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay, you can't stop God's work. You're way too small. You're way too weak to stop God's work. So I'm not saying that. I'm saying when I look at the church specifically in America, and I hear from the people who sit in these churches, and I hear the sermons of those people who preach in these churches, I go, the church is in trouble. We are long overdue for a new reformation. But the reason the church is in trouble is because pulpits are in trouble. Because pulpits are in trouble. Sorry. I'm glad you feel comfortable, though, to ask questions. (laughs) Anything else before we move on, Robin? You guys really need to sit in the back. (laughs) Gosh, it's unbelievable. Do you employ her to sing on Sunday morning? All right, well. (laughs) Okay, where in the world was I? The church is in trouble, right, thank you, okay. (laughs) The church is in trouble. because pulpits are in trouble. And I'm telling you, the reason pulpits are in trouble is because preachers fail to distinguish what Paul distinguishes so clearly in these verses. The distinction between God's law 
and God's gospel. That's why. I know that sounds ethereal, and it sounds theoretical and impractical, so I'm going to spell this out, okay, because he spells it out very, very clearly here. All of God's Word, all of it, Genesis to Revelation, every line, every verse, every part of God's Word, all of God's Word to us comes to us in two forms of speech. Law and gospel, God's word of demand, which is law, and God's word of deliverance, which is gospel. Everything in the Bible, this is a bit simplistic, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but just for simplicity's sake, everything in the Bible that says do is law. Everything in the Bible that says done is gospel. Now, obviously, as Paul says here, both God's law and God's gospel come from God, which means both are good, and they are both absolutely necessary for us to hear. There is not one of God's two words that we stop needing to hear. They both come from God. They're both good, but they both do very, 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 very different things. And when we fail to understand their unique job descriptions, what happens is we will wrongly depend on the law to do what only the gospel can do, and we'll wrongly depend on the gospel to do what only the law can do. So there was a follower of John Calvin's a long, long time ago named Theodore Beza who wrote this, and it's a big statement, but I think he's right. He said, ignorance of this distinction between law and gospel, confusing God's speech, in other words. Ignorance of this distinction between law and gospel is the principal source of the abuses which corrupt Christianity. That's a global statement. I mean, that's, that's a big statement from a smart guy who understood, I mean, if I were to say to you, what are the principal sources of the abuses which corrupt Christianity? What would you say? Teenagers having sex? Um, you know, uh, just sort of our not standing up for what's right? I mean, what would you say? I mean, what would you say if I asked you what, are the, what is the principal source of the abuses which corrupt Christianity? Nine and a half out of ten people okay, um, would say something behavioral. Well, I, I'll tell you what corrupts Christianity. We're just not walking the walk, man. And we're talking the talk, but we're not walking the walk. What really needs to happen, if, we're, if Christianity is going to become credible again, we have to be the smartest ones in the public square. That's what needs to happen. And you know what? We're just sitting around in our little holy teepees, and we're not actually engaging the world. We need to engage the world. That's the principal abuse. We're not, we're all cloistered up in our own little holy huddles. What would you say? Well, Beza said that the principal source which fuels the abuses that corrupt Christianity is the ignorance of the distinction between law and gospel, confusing God's speech. You see, the failure to distinguish the law and the gospel always means the abandonment of the gospel. That's why it's so dangerous. And I'll tell you why. Because a confusion of law and gospel is the main contributor to Christless Christianity or moralism. When you confuse the law and the gospel, it contributes mightily to Christless Christianity. And this is why. Because the law gets softened into how to have a better marriage. That's what's heard. How to have a better marriage or how to raise better kids or helpful tips for practical living or applying timeless truths to your life so that you can have whatever it is you need and crave. That, that's what happens. A confusion of law and gospel contributes to moralism because the law gets softened into those things instead of God's unwavering demand for absolute perfection. That's what God's law does. It says, be perfect. Not try hard, but be perfect. And when we confuse law and gospel, we actually think we're giving people good news when we say things like, here are six things you can do to improve your life. 
I've said this before, go see Tony Robbins when he comes for that stuff. I'm not even knocking that stuff. There probably will work. I'm not saying that, but that's, that's not the job of the pulpit. I mean, it's not my job on Sunday mornings or the job or responsibility of any preacher on Sunday mornings to stand up and give you a checklist for how you can have your best life now. That's not the job. It is to announce God's two words. It's to basically say, be perfect. I can't be. I know Jesus was. Every sermon, every sermon, once a week, 45 minutes, sometimes 40, sometimes 90, regardless, every Sunday, once a week, once a, where else are you going to hear it? Where are you going to hear that? You're going to read that and you know, online, or you can, I mean, where are you going to hear it? God gathers us together every week so that we can hear His two words again. And then the next week, because lots of life is lived from, you know, uh, this Sunday to next Sunday, He gathers us together again, reorients us back to His two words. Be perfect. I can't be. I know Jesus was. Be perfect. I can't be. I know Jesus was. Be, be perfect. I can't be a wretched man that I am who will rescue me from this body of death. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Every week. And because that's not happening every week, the church is in trouble. Because it's become sort of self-help time on Sunday morning. Just give me helpful tips for practical living with a little twist of Jesus on it, you know? And the twist of Jesus usually happens in the form of singing before the motivational speaker gets up and says, here are the things you should do in order to, you know, in order to impress God and others, in order to feel good about yourself, as if that's the goal. Um, the first word of God is intended to make us feel bad about ourselves. God's intention on Sunday morning is to kill you and make you alive over and over and over again. Um, and so when we fail to distinguish law and gospel, uh, the law gets softened into helpful tips for practical living instead of God's unwavering demand for absolute perfection. And at the same time, the gospel gets hardened into a set of moral demands that we must live out instead of God's unconditional declaration that he justifies the ungodly. That's the gospel. Um, the law demands everything but gives nothing. The gospel demands nothing but gives everything. That's how God's two words work together. Um, John O., who will be at the staycation, okay, um, says it this way, and I love it. God doesn't serve mixed drinks. The divine cocktail is not law mixed with gospel. God serves two separate shots, law then gospel. Isn't that a great way of putting it? Let me read that again. I hope I don't cause any of you to stumble. Um, <laughs> God doesn't serve mixed drinks. The divine cocktail is not law mixed with gospel. God serves two separate shots, law, then gospel. So in Romans 7, what Paul's doing here is he's making this distinction, and what he's showing is that the law illuminates sin, but it's powerless to eliminate sin. Okay, that's not the job. It's not the job description of the law. The law illuminates it. Do, 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 do. Illuminates the fact that you're not doing, but do in and of itself doesn't actually empower you to do. Okay, so the, the law is like an x-ray machine. Shows you who you are and what you really need, and it forces you back to Jesus. Okay, that's what, that's what it does. Um, it points to righteousness, but can't produce it. And we make the mistake as preachers and parents and whatnot, that we just assume that if we just point to what's right, we've done our job. Just tell your kid over and over, clean your room. Clean your room. And then we wonder why we can say it 50,000 times. 
and you still have to tell them. You know, clean, I'm not saying don't tell them to clean their room. There comes a point where you just quit, just shut the door. Just give up, okay, until they move out, then redo the whole room. But, um, but I mean, you, you just, we assume that if we just tell someone what to do, that in and of itself will make them want to do it. I mean, that, that doesn't work out in our lives horizontally with anybody else. Why in the world do we think, you know, all right, you know, when, when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, he gives us the great commandment. Nowhere does he say, or nowhere does the Bible say, that the issuing of the command in and of itself is what gives you the power to do it. Well, where does the Bible say that the power comes from to love God and others? I said it last week, 1 John. We love him because he first loved us. The law does not produce love. It shows us what love is, and it shows us where we're failing to love. But it doesn't produce love. It's God's love for us coming our way in the announcement of the gospel that actually produces love for God and love for others. The law can inform us of our sin, but it cannot transform the sinner, no matter how many times you say it. I mean, if I ever stop speeding, it will not be because the speed limit sign is there. It hasn't worked for, you know, 30 years or 25. I started driving when I was 12. Uh, no, but really, I mean, I, I just, it's not, I'm glad it's there. I am glad the speed limit sign is there because it gives me some boundaries and it gives the other drivers boundaries. But the speed limit sign itself is not the thing that's going to make me want to keep the speed limit laws. Okay? That's not going to do it. It's a sign. It's, it's like, it's just exposing me every time I drive past it, every time. I was just going, you're breaking the law every time. And then I'll slow down because I don't want to get a ticket. But that's different than me saying, I want to do what's right and keep the law and be a good citizen, okay? Um, the law doesn't have the power to generate desire. It just doesn't have the power to, that's what Paul's saying here. He just like, I just, it just doesn't have that kind of power. Um, the gospel alone is the power of God unto salvation, which means that the law forces us to face our sin, but only the gospel can forgive us our sin. Um, I mean, the law accuses us, the gospel acquits us. The law exposes us, but only the gospel exonerates us. God's law diagnoses sinners, and God's gospel delivers sinners. God's law reveals how quick we are to run from Him. God's gospel reveals how quick He is to run after us. God's law shows us that our desperation is greater than we realize. God's gospel tells us that our deliverance is greater than we could have ever imagined. So, the law of God demands perfection. The gospel of God declares perfect all who trust in Jesus. The law demands that we do it all. The gospel declares that Jesus paid it all. The law may curtail bad behavior, but only grace can transform the heart. So God's law is for those who think they're good to show them that they're not. And God's gospel is for those who know that they're bad. So. Christian people, in other words, need the law to regularly reveal that we are worse off than we think. It's my, the first part of my job on Sunday mornings, to speak God's demands from every text in such a way that you will be reacquainted with your desperation, and you'll be cut down to your proper size and the press that you've believed about yourself or that I've believed about myself will be eliminated and we will be wide open once again to hear Jesus' words, I love you. 
and I've done it for you. It's okay. You're in. You don't have to be perfect because I was perfect for you, and you weren't doing a good job anyway. So it's not like I took the star player out of the lineup. You weren't doing a good, that's why I came. We need to be reminded that there is something that needs to be pardoned even in our best works and in our proudest achievements. But then, okay, and this is the second part of my job on Sunday morning. But then once we are re-crushed by the law and we are brought once again to our knees, We need to be reminded that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. We need to hear that. We never outgrow our need to hear that. We need to hear that the sins we cannot forget, God cannot remember, and that though the accuser may roar of sins that I have done, I know them all and thousands more Jehovah knoweth none. We need to hear that. I need to hear that. And you're worse than me. So if I need to hear it, you need to hear it, okay? I mean, we need to hear that every week. We need to hear over and over that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that nothing can separate us from God's love, and that Christians live their lives under a banner that reads, it is finished. We never, ever outgrow our need to hear that. If the preacher is preaching law, then gospel saying, be perfect, God's demand, be perfect. God's diagnosis, you're not. God's deliverance, Jesus was. That's, that's the message of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Be perfect, you're not, Jesus was. That's when you're faithfully preaching the Bible, not pulling out some kind of, you know, pulling out some text and saying, here, we're going to do 14 thousand weeks on how you should dare to be a Daniel. Does that bring anybody relief? Is that what God wants to say? Be like Daniel? That's what God wants to say? God wants to kill you so that he can make you alive. Week after week after week. Well, the job of God's first word is to do what Jesus did to the Samaritan woman at the well, remember? And... um, she leaves, he, he just, he knew her, even though he just met her, knew her. And she was so stunned and blown away by how deeply he knew her and knew everything about her that she leaves and runs back to her village and, and just, you know, basically says, come see a man who told me everything about me. Well, God's first word is to do what Jesus did to that Samaritan woman at the well, to tell us everything we've ever done. And God's law describes us accurately. I mean, this is what Paul's wrestling with here. It describes us accurately and powerfully. I mean, Paul's telling us here that inability is our resume. But it's not the end of the story. In Christ, we are no longer under the law, but under grace. Christ has taken our law-breaking to the cross and freely given us his law-keeping record. It's amazing. That's what I need to hear when I'm crashing and burning. That's what I need to hear when I'm being bad, and that's what I need to hear when I think I'm good. That's what I need to hear when I'm doing the right thing so I don't become proud and think that I'm pulling it off, and that's what I need to hear when I'm doing the wrong thing. Jehovah knoweth none. Um... And so, we, when we see ourselves described so awfully, like in Romans chapter 7, I mean, we want to die. We want to say with Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to rescue me from this body of death? And we can't live in a world where the truth about us is proclaimed for all to see or exposed. But another has stood in our place, and the law can't hurt us anymore. In Jesus, we've already been tried and executed for the crimes that God's law rightfully accuses us of. It's done. So let me just, let me close with this. Um, This comes from 
an amazing, amazing little book called Who Will Deliver Us. It's amazing. The Present Power of the Death of Christ is the subtitle, and it's written by uh, my dear friend Paul Zoll. It's only about 80 pages, maybe 90. It's really, really good. But he talks about how what it actually means and feels like for us to be um, under grace, a slave of righteousness. The law threatens, the law accuses, and it should always remind us that we need Jesus. But it can't bite us. It can't, it can't condemn us because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he uses this illustration that I want to read real quickly um, that just captivated me from the get-go. He said, I'm a little like the duck hunter who was hunting with his friend in a wide open barren of land in southeastern Georgia. Far away on the horizon, he noticed a cloud of smoke. Soon he could hear the sound of crackling. A wind came up and he realized the terrible truth. A brush fire was advancing his way. It was moving so fast that he and his friend could not outrun it. The hunter began to rifle through his pockets. Then he emptied all of the contents of his knapsack. He soon found what he was looking for, a book of matches. To his friend's amazement, he pulled out a match and struck it. He lit a small fire around the two of them. Soon they were standing in a circle of blackened earth, waiting for the brush fire to come. They did not have to wait long. They covered their mouths with their handkerchiefs and they braced themselves. The fire came near and swept over them, but they were completely unhurt. They weren't even touched. Fire would not burn the place where fire had already burned. The law is like the brush fire. I cannot escape it. This is just beautiful. But if I stand in the burned over place where law has already burned its way through. Then and there I huddle, hardly believing, yet relieved. Christ's death has disarmed the law. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord.